My name is Melissa Rambula and I will be presenting for my English 200 class. Um, my literary theory that I chose was feminism and in our chapter, feminism is described as a simple concept and to sum it all up, it's about taking women seriously and respecting their viewpoint and understandings. Um, in this chapter, in this chapter, Parker brings up misogyny and it's a big part of feminism, but um, basically it means when women aren't taken seriously because they are women. And this is what feminists call the patriarchy, which is basically men belittling women because they are women when in actuality women are equal to, to men. And to give some backstory to feminism, there is a grasp for dominance, to have control and power uh, over the other sex. Over tens of thousands of years in which humans have walked this planet, there has been an oppression which is basically seen as a normal thing. No one ever really thought of it as, oh, well, maybe women aren't as dumb as we think, and maybe they have voices and maybe we should listen to them because they have good ideas. But you know, that didn't happen until way later in history. So basically, for years, this oppression was normal, natural, and the right way. And not until voices started speaking out was this changed. These voices were realizing the deck was stacked against women, and it was very unfair in, in that case. Feminism is defined as the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of equality of the sexes, and women would no longer stand for that inequality. After the first wave of feminism, which was called women's suffrage, society had slightly changed, but women were still being oppressed in all aspects of life, which was sexually, politically, economically, and socially. The rage of women was condensing, boiling, and finally exploded in what we call a second wave of feminism. The first prominent movement for women's liberation was during the early 20th century when women fought for their suffrage. In 1920, an amendment was passed that granted women the federal vote. In 1920, the amendment was passed that granted women the federal vote. The time leading up to that year, as well as the time after that, was what is now called the first wave of feminism. The age of flopper girls then fizzled, and women were awarded few rights aside from the vote. This then led to the next and most wild wave of feminism. In 1963, a book called The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan was published. This book was important because it proposed the idea that women were only recognized solely for the role of sexual objects and caretakers to men and child bearers and basically not for the people who they were. Three years after this book was published, the National Organization for Women was formed to help fight for women's issues. During the 1960s and 1970s, there was a movement involving young women called Students for a Democratic Society. There were men and women in this movement advocating for fundamental policies and exercising their rights to free speech and protest, but opportunities were not fair among them. While the men were out getting credit and standing on the front lines, women were behind the scenes organizing and doing the grunt work. This led to a realization. Why were the men getting all the credit when the women were doing all the work. Female members of the SDS movement slowly began to talk, exchange the stories, and they came to understand that this experience was similar for a lot of women. This feeling of rejection was a shepherd to guide outraged young women into the women's liberation movement and into groups such as the National Organization for Women. The second wave of feminism did not solely consist of radical women, but the movement was the most extreme and saw the most change. The societal norms had drastically changed since the first wave of feminism when it came to women working. It was now more common for a woman to have a job, but her options were extremely, extremely limited when it came to what kind of work she wanted to do. And she had to have 
an assistant job or she had to be working underneath a man. But at least women had jobs, right? Newspaper advertisements for job openings would state men only for positions of power. And advertisements for secretaries and assistant jobs would say, you may become his wife. Where, where is the equality in that? Because there's not. So women had power, but only if they were under a man. And that's still not what they fought for. There was a widespread idea that women were now equal, but there was also dramatic undertones of sexism as well as bland and misogyny. A woman working in an office as a secretary was 100% almost guaranteed to be hit on, especially just when she began to gain power. Sex was used as a tool to take power from women, and if she refused, her life was made miserable and she would get fired and basically everything that she worked for was thrown down the drain because she didn't wanna do what he wanted her to do. The idea of sex was a double-edged sword for women, a catch-22 basically. She was led to believe that a sexual woman was acceptable, but at the same time were not given the proper resources to, to be able to have safe sex. However, birth control was not only difficult to obtain, but it was also extremely dangerous. Without birth control or proper education, women were getting pregnant and abortion was illegal until 1973. So it makes sense why feminism is so important because our bodies are still not our bodies. Even in 2020, 21st century, we are fighting for our rights and we are fighting for basically control over our own body. Radical feminism is defined in many different ways, one being the elimination of sexual division of labor, but it covered much more than that in the 1960s and 70s. The focus of the movement was to dismantle the patriarchy and eliminate domination and elitism among all. This movement was also characterized by its essentialist construction of the category of women, its universalization of the category of women, and its sole focus on women's oppression. These feminists were not afraid to talk of the subjects no one else dared to discuss, like women's sexuality. Radical feminists pointed out that women's emotional and sexual needs were just as important as men's. Radical feminism is also concentrated, more ferocious and militant version of feminism that sparked a mountain of change during its peak. Feminism also helped the LGBTQ community. A gay person in the 1960s and 70s spent their life closeted and silenced and hidden and basically fearing for their lives because it wasn't safe for them to speak out and express their needs. The Lavender Menace was a group formed when lesbianism was not accepted in the movement of women's liberation, and they are the ones that put gay women on the map. So. You may be asking the question, where does this fall in line with the importance of feminism in literature? Feminist literary criticism recognizes that literature both reflects and shapes stereotypes and other cultural assumptions. Thus, feminist literary criticism examines how works of literature embody patriarchal attitudes or undercut them. Sometimes, sometimes this both happens within the same work. Feminist theory in various forms of feminist critique began long before the formal naming of the school of literary criticism. In so-called first wave feminism, the Women's Bible, written in the late 19th century by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, is an example of a work of criticism firmly in this school, looking beyond the more obvious male-centered outlook and interpretation. How is feminism important in literature? It uses the principles of ideology of feminism to critique the languages of literature. This school of thought seeks to analyze and describe the ways in which literature portrays a narrative of male domination by exploring the economic, social, political, and psychological forces embedded within literature. Feminist theory is a similarly broad and contested term. It generally refers to theories of women's experience and of the subordination of women by men. It is commonly taken to include both what philosophers call positive and normative claims. 
The positive claims are descriptions and explanations of how gender systems work. They are the conceptual and theoretical part of empirical gender studies. Normative claims answer philosophical questions about how gender arrangements ought to be. They deal with questions of ethics and social justice. Philosophers, including political theorists, wrote much of the normative feminist theory of recent decades. Feminist theory encompasses a range of diverse ideas, all of which originate with the following beliefs. Traditional ways of thinking support the subordination of women and the neglect of trivialization of issues particularly affecting women. Feminist theory impacts all institutions, medical, legal, literary, academic, and social. Who are some iconic feminist writers in literature? Some of you may be familiar with Louisa May Alcott, feminist and transcendentalist with strong family ties to Massachusetts. Louisa May Alcott is best known for her 1868 novel about her four sisters, Little Women, based on an idealized version of her own family. Maya Angelou, African-American author, playwright, poet, dancer, actress, and singer, who wrote around 36 books and acted in plays and musicals. Her most famous work is the autobiography, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, written in 1969. In it, she spares no detail of her chaotic childhood. Jane Austen. Jane Austen was an English novelist whose name did not appear on her popular works until after her death, which is not surprising since women weren't accredited for their work, their hard work. She led a relatively sheltered life, yet she wrote the most beloved stories of relationships and marriage in Western literature. Some of her novels include Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Mansfield Park, Emma, and Persuasion. Emily Dickinson, recognized among the most influential of American poets, Emily Dickinson lived most of her life as a recluse in Amherst, Massachusetts. Many of her poems, which had strange capitalization and dashes, can be interpreted to be about death. Among her well-known poems are Because I Could Not Stop for Death and A Narrow Fellow in the Grass. Margaret Fuller, part of the New England Transcendentalist Movement, she was a confidant of Ralph Waldo Emerson and a feminist when women's rights were not robust. She's most known for her work as a journalist at the New York Tribune and her essay, Women in the 19th Century. She lived from 1810 to 1850. The list goes on for women writers in literature, and that is because women looked up to these amazing writers because they felt that it was important to be heard and be seen and these women gave them the ability to feel that way. These women helped in the process by being a voice for women and giving them a sense of identity in which they were being erased. Men were erasing their identity and forcing them to stay home and create little children and clean the house and cook and stuff and you know some women just aspired to be more than that and I think that these writers were very important to literature and very important to history because they gave women a sense of identity. To sum everything up I want to bring up page 177 of chapter 6 in feminism. You may see right there Lady Gaga. She was really radical about how she put herself out there as a feminist and as a woman and as um, this beyond being of beauty and sexuality and how to embrace it. And I'm really glad that that figure 6.5 brought that up because even today, women are still radicalized by embracing their own body and embracing their own sexuality. And I thought this chapter was very interesting.